Oh, welcome everyone to the fourth edition of the Berlin Tech Leads. This is the final one for the year and once again, fully digital. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, attendees from Berlin, Germany, and hopefully all over the place, all over the globe. So if you haven't been here before, just a short description of the event. Um, so this is a meetup group for various technical leaders, um, tech leads, engineering managers, directors, you name it. Uh, this is to share experiences and learn from one another. What This has been popular in Vilnius for quite some time, where Vinted's from. And so we, we'd like to bring this to Berlin and Germany and beyond. We believe that leadership is something that you'll learn and not something that you're born with. So each of our meetups have a specific topic to teach. This one is about data science and analytics. Now, a short, um, you know, a short recap of what we've done in the past. We've had three events so far, very successful with great speakers, interesting topics, uh, topics such as how to facilitate communities and how to remain sustainable even when you grow rapidly. So we try to present di uh, diverse opinions, insights, and display how uh, different the interpretation of a topic can be. So we encourage uh, everybody to participate, and we try to provide the tech community with, with food for thought and aspects that they haven't um, that they haven't considered yet. So we want to encourage you today to join in this exchange with, with the professionals that we have and join in with us in, in the meetup group so we can fuel the innovation uh, at the end of the day. So today's topic, the one with data science and analytics. AI and machine learning offer uh, enormous possibilities to personalize content on, individual, on an individual level and to tailor a product of any kind to very specific needs, but how do you choose the best and most efficient approach from all these available options that you have to incorporate uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning? What does the journey, especially for tech leads, look like to move from a rules-based to a data-driven strategy? What kind of like real-life obstacles might you face when you're transforming your organization from, from this, um, you know, in this type of development? And, what can you do to ensure that your data science and analytics team will continue to grow on, on a path that is useful for them, useful for your users, and useful for your businesses? So today we have four amazing speakers. Yes, four. We have a pair. Uh, four amazing speakers who will share their experiences. We've got Hong Dang. He's the founder and CEO at Y42. We've got Jehan uh, Darren Bogas. He's the CTO at Tex Cortex. And then we have James Ryan and uh, Germinus Zilius uh, from Vinted. Uh, James is the Director of Data Science and Analytics, and uh, Germinus is a Manager of Data Science and Analytics here at Vinted. So if you, uh, if you could take a look down into the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you see a, a chat box. This is where we'll interact. If you have questions uh, during the presentation, the present presenters' presentations, please write them in that chat. And then at the end of the presentation, I will interview them and ask them the questions that, that you have asked them, and, and you will get your answers. If you think of something while we're while we're questioning and answering back and forth, please remember to to ask those questions too, because we, there's the time is not out, and you, you haven't run out of time there yet. So our first speaker is Hung Dang, founder at and CEO of Y42. Hung will talk about the limitations of the modern data stack and what scalable data ops should look like instead. So Hung, uh, the stage is all yours. Please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for the nice intro and for having me here. Um, so as I can hear, I think we have a very yeah, a variety uh, of different yeah, listeners um, today. Um, so I don't want to try to just go very deep into just data engineering or data topics, uh, but also a bit broader about you know founding a company or software engineering um, in general. Um, as Adam said, I'm, I'm the founder of a company called Y42. We're based in Berlin. Um, we started just yeah, um, three years ago. Um, so it's still a very young company, but um, yeah, we uh, still uh, a reasonable size. Uh, by We're roughly 150 people right now. Um, and what we do is, uh, yeah, we release a product which is called uh, the Modern Data Ops Cloud. Um, so what we want to bring, what DevOps did to software, uh, to data, um, that's why data ops. Um, and a bit about my background. So um, I've been in the data space for yeah, almost all my life. You know, my, my mom 
she started her PhD in statistics. My my um, my stepdad, he's a professor in sociology and teaches statistics. So I grew up very mathematically, uh, but I did not grow up um, as a software engineer. And this experience I had when I started my last company in 2016. Um, so I basically yeah, started a software company. Uh, it was a data analytics company um, for the live event industry. So like every Ed Sheeran or Justin Bieber concert or like major festivals uh, in Europe um, were using our software. And I sold that company yeah, end of 2019. Um, and yeah, with the experience also yeah, with a bit of money uh, from before I started uh, yeah, Y42. And the reason why I started it is um, due to the rise of the... Um, yeah, uh, of the data warehouses such as, uh, you know, Google BigQuery uh, or Redshift and Snowflake. Um, I was one of the first users of, um, yeah, of, uh, of BigQuery. And um, so the, the power of these data warehouses led to a series of companies um, in the data space, um, yeah, leads to the creation of a series of companies such as, you know, uh, Fivetran or Airbyte for in the data integration tool, um, DBT for yeah, data transformation, um, new open source visualization tools like Metabase, um, Airflow for, you know, data orchestration and so on and so forth. So there's like a vast array of tools, uh, but the whole yeah, space is very fragmented. And this is, um, and I felt like, you know, that we are very much still in the, the infancy stage of what's possible um, within the tooling, within the processes, um, with the modern data stack. And this is why I decided to jump back into the game uh, three years ago. Now, um, let's look into what our insights has been over the course of the yeah, couple of years. Um, and first of all, um, the use case for data has really shifted um, a lot from just ad hoc reporting. Um, and it's being leveraged now in yeah, applications and key automated decision making. So, um, yeah, data uh, is the key, yeah, it's the lifeblood right now uh, of every organization, as I've said, for C level key decision making, for machine learning models, for operational application. And these um, systems are increasingly becoming complex, um, actually exponentially complex. Now, all of these ad hoc build pipelines, they will inevitably break um, and cause many issues. And companies that are stuck in this old BI mindset, um, yeah, they will uh, face a lot of trouble. Now, there are many reasons for that. Um, you could think of it like, uh, hey, you have um, multiple steps in the pipeline. Let's assume you have 10 steps in the pipeline and each of the step will fail uh, with a 1% failure rate every time you run it. So you have an SLA of 99%, which is, you know, on paper, pretty good. But let's assume you have 10 nodes within one pipeline. You run that pipeline once a day. Um, then the probability of that failing is going to be 9.56% already. Uh, and if you're able to increase the failure rate or decrease the failure rate for, um, from 1% to 0.1%, so, and you know, like uh, SLA of 99.9%, um, the your failure rate will be only 0.956%. And failure is, uh, you know, very fat fatal because um, it requires you time to spend on the recovery, damage control, but then a lot of communication overhead uh, and distrust in data because, uh, you know, your uh, CMO will say, hey, I don't trust the data anymore. Like, why is that wrong? Um, and so you try to reduce those failure rates as much as you can within your system. But it's not just that, you know, like we all know Brooks Law, um, the more people work on something, the more line of communication there is, the harder it gets to collaborate, knowledge sharing gets harder, governance gets much harder, and, and, and. And so to better this level of exponential complexity in the system that is required to fulfill all of these use cases for data, uh, frontier data leaders are currently adopting best practices from software engineering. Um, and like, you know, maybe you've heard of Chad Sanderson before. Um, he's saying that if you're writing SQL and pushing that dashboard to a public environment, that is also a product. And so it must be subject to the same level of rigor as any other product. And um, if you look at like this graph right now, so um, the amount of use cases on the x-axis and the complexity is on the y-axis. So it means without any best practices, um, the complexity would just increase because you have so many more use cases for data, as I've said, for reporting, for machine learning, for you know, operational applications. And this complexity results in you know, higher engineering, like more engineering hours and more money that you pay without these best practices. And um, the way to better that is what we call um, yeah, 
uh, data ops. Um, so it means you include software engineering and DevOps best practices. And in order to better the complexity through uh, agility and governance and move to a scalable data infrastructure and processes. Now, um, as I've said before, we want to bring to um, the data world what DevOps did to software. And you have like this continuous cycle of, hey, plan, develop, build, manage, test, and then you release it, um, you deploy it, you operate, and you monitor it. And all of that, that happens as automatic as possible. And by doing that, um, you have very quick iteration cycles. So you don't do like waterfall planning of like, oh, we're going to release something in three months or in six months. You have like this continuous cycle of feedback. You have, uh, yeah, uh, you stay very agile. You can involve other stakeholders. Um, and really, um, data ops increases agility and governance, and it ultimately helps you to like, reduce the complexity of a system, ensures its availability, security, scalability, just you know, build products faster and like, uh, automate as much as you can. So it goes from business requirements to business value uh, through a very iterative cycle. Um, and yeah, so there are six um, core pillars um, of data ops, which uh, I want to yeah, uh, talk about. And that's also the end of this presentation afterwards. Um, and on a high level, it's scalable and accessible data pipelines. Um, data infrastructure is code, environment management with CICD, continuous testing and monitoring, governance and change control, um, and collaboration and self-service. And those are like the six pillars um, of data ops. Now, let me get started with um, the first pillar, which is um, scalable and accessible data pipeline. Now, it's very important that when you set up a data pipeline, so you operate on top of a data warehouse like BigQuery or Snowflake, you need to integrate data from different systems, right? So let's say you're in e-commerce, you're selling on Shopify, on Amazon, you're doing your advertisement on Google Ads and TikTok. And so in order just to know how much you're selling, you need to pull data already from Amazon and Shopify. Um, and that's the first step that you do. You build out data pipelines from this OLTP system. You pull data inside your uh, OLAP system, uh, which once again are those data warehouses. Then you need to transform the data. Um, you could use low code, SQL, Python, whatever you want. Um, you need to orchestrate uh, the entire data pipeline. Um, and yeah, you can also visualize a part of it. And once you have production ready tables, you want to build out a metrics layer. Um, that is the single source of truth to define all the metrics um, within your yeah your entire system. Like what does um, you know revenue mean, net retention? You define it in one place, and then you make that accessible to the rest of the tooling down here. So that's the first step. You really set up a scalable and accessible data pipeline. Um, and what we do here at Y42 is we um, natively take the best of breed open source software. Um, which is, for example, Airby for integrations or DBT for data transformation. And we natively integrate them together. So we just don't lightly stitch them, but we all run them under the hood within one web interface and one API and one CLI. Um, so yeah, many workflows that requires um, a, a lot of steps in between, between different tools, you can do it within one tool uh, very natively. And that reduces like roughly 50% of all the clicks that you need to do. Now, that's the first part. The second pillar, which is also very important, is um, data infrastructure as code. So similar to what Terraform did, um, you need to be able, the code repository should be the single source of truth for the definition of every part of the data pipeline. Um, so it can be fully audited, version controlled, and easily roll back. So every uh, part of your entire data pipeline, you should provision these artifacts, uh, like uh, every part of it from table schema all the way to ELT pipelines like integration and data transformation and orchestration, it should be all defined in code. Um, and yeah, similar how a DevOps team use Terraform for their infrastructure. And also code, yeah, you can use it uh, for maintainable and reusable components following the don't repeat yourself uh, mantra. And then uh, there's also, it, once you stitch together your pipeline, um, yeah, that's the first step, right? Like stitching together, uh, even if you were not using Y42 and you stitch together a uh, data pipeline, you need to manage now environments because you have a prop environment and you obviously don't want to change everything up there. You have to then clone that data on a dev environment. So you have data to work with. And then when you finish with the dev environment, you need to merge it into prop environment. Um, and yeah, all of that is like, you have to build out uh, environment management and CI, CD. That's like one of the hardest part uh, to actually really master well for any data teams out there. But it's a very crucial part that you master it well. 
Um, and then, yeah, uh, after that, you have to really productionize the data pipelines with continuous testing and monitoring. Like, um, you know, you have data tests uh, that verify the content of the data. You have unit tests, you have uh, observability. So you have like anomaly detection, uh, maybe the distribution of one of the columns uh, after the most recent imports, they are not uh, the way it's supposed to be. Like there might be outliers and you see that the average age uh, became from like 35 to 64. So that's an outlier in there. Um, so Y42 is not very good yet at uh, anomaly detection. Um, but yeah, so about everything else, yeah, you have to also uh, optimize for cost and you know, performance optimization. Now, the, this is one of the biggest part. Um, governance um, is very hard right now with the modern data stack across five to six different tools that you need to glue together. Um, and But governance is extremely important. You need to apply policies on tables like PII, like you need to hide PII information. Uh, certain people only have access to this specific uh, table, but then also just to this specific row or column. Um, you need to manage like change control, like pull requests. You have to you know protect your branches, uh, similar to software engineering. You need to set up an ownership system and access control and so on and so forth. And that's very hard to master also, but a big part so that your team can stay agile um, and move forward fast. And the last but not least, you need to have uh, collaboration and self-service. Um, so data is not like DevOps, uh, you know, like uh, data is being used by business users, by data analysts, by business analysts, by C-level, uh, whereas, yeah, DevOps uh, have to serve primary software engineers uh, as the primary persona and they're super technical. So you need to enable uh, self-service. Um, uh, I mean, DevOps enables self-service also um, to the software engineers, but the way self-service looks like for a uh, less technical uh, persona is you need to have like uh, a UI, a UX for the data cataloging, data lineage to, to trace back all the assets. You have to be able to like self-explore what data exists um, and then make that self-service so they can access that data in their tools like a Jupyter Notebook or you know, a headless um, Jupyter Notebook uh, BI tools. But then you, uh, and we have here the hypothesis that we should enable even less technical users to build out their own data pipelines after they understand what data is there. And we offer a low code layer uh, for them um, in order to yeah, uh, work on that. And it's like similar, like a Figma experience. So I'm not a designer um, and I basically create, I go to Figma and I create some design because I have the business domain knowledge, uh, but then I hand it over to a designer to productionize that design. And that's a very, very similar workflow that we uh, currently see uh, yeah, users working with our tool. Um, I'm a data analyst. Uh, I'm not as good with SQL or Python. Uh, I go inside the app fully governed. Uh, I can explore what data already exists, how the pipeline looks like in a very visual way. And then I can participate in the pipeline creation process by um, yeah, creating something with low code. And then I hand it over to the engineer and say, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, and I already built out that pipeline for myself and the engineer can take that and either turn it into proper code or leave it like that um, and protect that more. And so like um, you really have to master again all of these six pillars so you yeah, can move uh, and like master the complexity of the system behind it. Uh, and all in all, um, this is what we do here at Y42. We basically select the best of breed open source tools. Um, we uh, natively integrate them together. We apply all the ops practices on top, like from governance to collaboration, environment management, CI, CD, Everything is as code. You have one version control. You have one access control. You have one uh, yeah, interface, one API, one CLI, instead of like five to six or seven different ones. We provision all of these tools under the hood uh, if we don't run them. And yeah, like Bob Nuclear once says, um, you cannot yeah, master the whole process here, uh, especially not if you only have a team of one to three people. And that's why the idea of putting all uh, to get in one system supported by the modern data stack is the only way to solve these problems. Um, and yeah, this is what we do. Um, in a nutshell, um, we uh, help our users operate on top of their data warehouse, um, really focusing on the pipeline first that is natively integrated, uh, helps them to collaborate with environment and CICD and governance. Um, yes, that's in a nutshell what we do. Are we clear?
Okay. So thank you. Thank you. That was, that was, as some people have commented, very, very complete, very informative. We do have some questions. Huh? Um, could you explain how data ops is different from ML ops? Uh, some people aren't recognizing uh, much of a difference between that, that term that they already know. Um, that's a good question because, uh, so to be fair, I'm not uh, an ML developer. Um, I'm a statistician, so um, I know the mathematical formula very well, but I'm not the person who productionizes uh, yeah, ML and, you know, there's like a feature store, there's a, like, what well, there's a lot of steps like that comes afterwards, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to claim I know much about that, but uh, I do know very well how the the path of like you have to build out your first core data infrastructure um, for reporting first um, within your data warehouse um, but also then for like a reverse ETL use case but also to reuse certain metrics uh, within your Jupyter notebook um, and that pipeline might be very similar to MM ops pipeline however um, yeah, it's very hard for me to to pinpoint you the exact difference uh, if I don't know the steps very well. So, I think, well, it's it, it, thank you for taking a, a stab at some of it. Um, another question is: uh, Would analytics engineers in the in the roles in charge of data ops uh, be so? Would they be in charge of that? And like, based on your experience, uh, what are the roles working on data ops currently? Yeah. So it's uh, either an analytics engineer or a data engineer uh, that would work, or if the obviously the company gets bigger, they would have a dedicated data ops person, uh, like a DevOps person also. And that's a very common setup as well for bigger companies. And one last question from, from, from my side, if you don't mind. Um, you, you mentioned how there's a difference in the the consumers or the the operations side side of this where it's it's now more business users and less of the the nerds out in their their nerderies can you can you still apply those devops topologies from like skeleton and, and pays for example to help you through moving the organization through the, the transition uh from where they are now to something more like data ops or is it best to to not make too much, too close of an association between the dynamics of DevOps and all the stuff that's been written on that in this this new concept of data ops. Um, again, it's a hard question for me. It was a very long question, okay. um, but um, I mean, I'm trying to answer the pieces that I understood. So first of all, uh, the difference between data ops and DevOps, uh, in my point of view, there is not much. Um, the pillars that I showed before of data ops, the six pillars, I basically copy paste them over from DevOps and just say, hey, that's the data ops pillar. It's like environment management and CI, CD, data infrastructure as code. Well, in DevOps, it's infrastructure as code uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, uh, but the only difference between data ops is, yes, you have one more part, which is the ELT pipeline. You need to automate that, orchestrate that, ingestion, transform. So that's like the only part that's really different from DevOps. And but the benefit is sim exactly the same, and the practices are identical to that as well. Now, again, uh, hopefully, I understood your question correctly. Um, how do you take on the business user on that journey? Like, and I think that's a very difficult um, thing to do. I don't know. Can can I still share my screen? Is that possible? I believe so. Can we make that happen? People up there in the control booth. Yeah, so um, this is how our app looks like, right? And you wouldn't feel right now that, hey, uh, it's a like a UI layer, no code, low code. But what actually happens under the hood is when I refresh the app, what we do is we are cloning a repo right now, check, checking our branch. Um, this is a fetching a repository status, uh, pulling the latest changes. This is a very big repo, by the way, where like, uh, 50 people work on all the time. So it might take, yeah, it He's might take a while. He's demoing everybody, cross your fingers for him. Yeah. So what you see right here is um, everything here is we built the biggest, uh, the fastest Git engine in the world using WebAssembly. And what it does basically um, is when we start the app, we are fetching this uh, uh, 
uh, the repository, put it inside IndexedDB. So uh, right now we're on main. We shouldn't do that. We should go to another feature branch. Um, and then um, that's the local. So every business user, whatever they do, like for example, they are changing the name uh, of the intercom to intercoms. And it's basically a local change that we did. So you need to commit all of that. And so you are adhering to all the best practices of software engineering still. And if you're an engineer, well, you can just go to the code mode and you can like edit your entire um, data stack, like from integration to modeling to orchestration as code. But all of this code is being represented one by one as the visual uh, within the low code layer here. So we are very much inviting business user to work on this process, uh, but yeah, still uh, following the best practices of the software engineering way, so to say. All right, and that, and that leads into that. What needs to be our, our final question is, you know, can can someone uh, jump into data ops with kind of a, uh, you know, a, a DL 101 level of stuff? Or do they need to have an advanced knowledge of, of machine learning and, and data analytics in order to, to get them there? Um, I don't think so. And that's the beauty of data ops. It's like a very, you know, like new category, new field, which completely makes sense. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased in the, uh, very biased in here, um, but we have to look at it from a different angle. Um, for example, in our company, uh, we have uh, around 50 or 60 engineers by now, but we only have a data team of three people. So it's like a difference of a 20X and that's very common. So in, uh, for example, blah, blah car, um, they are like thousands of people but they only have a data team like of 40 people. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers so, or uh, hopefully it's, uh, yeah, but either way, even a blah, blah, car, very big, you know, multi-billion dollar company, they have a data team of 40 people. Um, and so most of the teams, data teams out there, they're rather small, right? They're like one, two, three, four, five, until 10 people. Um, and so uh, data ops is something that has been handled usually by the data engineer or by the analytics engineer up until then. And will it become like a full-fledged role? Probably more on an enterprise level rather than on a level of like, oh, I'm just like 500 or 1,000 employee. I don't think that, that there will be a dedicated data ops for that position. Nevertheless, um, every engineer or analytics engineer should apply uh, or build out these best practices with like either 20, 30 or 40% of the time um, but they would still need to build out pipeline, you know, like build out, use DBT, build out SQL uh, pipelines uh, and so on and so forth or build out integrations. And so I think it's uh, it's definitely a role more uh, for the enterprise level, but then you should be really trained. You should have like some DevOps background uh, in there because uh, it's very similar practices that you need to do. But uh, when you start with a smaller companies, um, that's definitely something that you, you should aim for and you should learn either way. It's going to make you a better engineer overall. Uh, and it sounds like there's there's a good uh, possibility for transferring skills of what you do, the skills that you do know to an, uh, an unknown uh, topic or area, which is which is a nice way to learn stuff. But thank you for all that that, that great information. Thank you for also helping people to discover the, this, new, this new topic. I really appreciate it and, 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 enjoy, um, and enjoyed hearing about it. But And now it's time to head over to, to James and get Aminas. But first, I just wanted to post something in the chat there. Everybody put your eyes on it. There's a, there's a link to a survey about this event right here and, and the meetup group itself. If you fill it out, we're, um, we really appreciate your feedback. And we're also offering a, a 20 euro Vinted uh, gift card that we'll, we'll raffle out uh, based, you know, to the people that have uh, given us our, our, that feedback. So we would really appreciate it if you did that, and it's a possibility to get something on the back end. But uh, if so, if you could take a, a quick minute and do that, really appreciate it. But up next are James Ryan, director of data science and analytics at Vinted, and uh, Geminus Julius, who is the manager of data science and analytics at Vinted. My friends. Um, and they have a talk about transforming towards an ML-based personalized discovery experience at Vinted. So James Gadaminas, the stage is all yours now. Oh, th thank you very much, Adam. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm James Ryan. I'm a DSA director at Vinted, and I'm going to set the scene for Gadaminas and myself by telling you briefly about how we empower data science and analytics at the company before 
um, passing you on to Gedaminas uh, for a more personalized journey. So to give you some context, uh, Vinted's mission in sustainability is to make secondhand first choice worldwide. And an essential element of that is the creation of the Vinted marketplace. Now, it'll come as no uh, surprise to the audience that creating a platform that enables rewarding, engaging, and secure experience, well, that's a complex task. And it requires many areas of expertise and matching, of which I am the DSA director, um, is one of those domains. So matching gets its name because we are responsible for matching buyers with the items of their dreams. Um, but in reality, that's just one element uh, of what we do. In fact, we are responsible for essentially all aspects of the search and discovery experience on the platform. So to be a bit more specific, that means creating and structuring the item catalog, building that engine that delivers the most relevant content to the search and discovery opportunities that we provide our users, and through to creating those frictionless engaging experiences that uh, user experiences for our for our users as they browse for and seek out their latest styles. So to create such a complex product offering, well, that requires a diverse set of skills, um, even within data science and analytics itself. So to kick it off, you know, as a user uh, navigates their search and discovery experience, they perform many varied actions. So they view items, they may click on items, favorite items, and if we're doing our job well, they might even buy an item at the end of a session. So what that means for us is that they generate, through these actions, a, vo a body of data that is both voluminous and intricate. And in turn, that renders it essentially inefficient, if not impossible, to for our analysts and modelers to act on these raw event streams directly. So we need analytics engineers that can create multi-layered data models so that that enables our analysts and ML engineers to jump in at the right level of granularity. In turn, as we build out our product development, Vinted is committed to doing so in a scientific manner. So the responsibilities of our decision scientists are mainly twofold. So on the one hand, they're responsible for quantitative R&D during the feature creation phase, but they are also responsible for evaluating impact as we release these features into the wild. Now, Vinted's marketplace has a characteristic. It's a two-sided marketplace, and it is populated with highly unique user-generated content. So this presents significant statistical challenges as one, in order to perform trustworthy online experiments. And we need decision scientists who have that expertise to design, implement, and evaluate experiments in that challenging environment. And finally, um, you know, ML is integral to the search and discovery experience on our platform. So, and ML traces its way throughout everything that matching does. So on the one hand, as, I, as users upload items to the platform, they provide us with rich unstructured data in the form of images and textual descriptions. And we need expertise in computer vision and NLP to extract those invaluable attributes that help us aid them, both buyers and sellers, in their journey. Moreover, you know, as we supply and populate the most relevant content to those search and discovery experiences, we need to have experts in recommendation systems, as well as information retrieval and ranking in order to make that a success. And last but not least on this, this slide, those systems, they need to be robust and work at scale and with low latency. So a significant engineering and ML engineering challenge. Okay, so to the crux of my part of, of the talk, how do we set ourselves for, up for success? Well, we have identified some key ingredients. So one part of this is that engineering, product and design, as well as DSA, um, are all represented equally at essentially 
all decision making levels of the uh, of the organization. For example, in matching, you know, DSE they does not exist on its own. There are product managers, there are designers, and there is a rich selection of engineers, front end, back end, search specialists, QA, and so on. In order to have all these uh, skill sets working together productively, well, that's a subtle challenge. And having those uh, those four uh, capabilities represented explicitly at all levels, that's very, very useful. So for example, I, as DSA director in matching, I create the matching strategy with my counterparts in engineering product and design that supports the broader marketplace strategy and also incorporates that impact input and feedback from our direct reports in the teams. In turn, having that representation at the decision-making level that enables us to give freedom to our individual contributors within the domain so that they can form these multifunctional units and build out solutions collaboratively to the uh, problems that they're, they're actually facing once we've set the strategy. Um, and finally, uh, and last but not least, you know, even though we give this freedom in the domains, we are also conscious about standardization. So Vinted, as the broader Vinted company, is building out a set of platforms, data, experimentation, and ML that promotes standardization and communication and enables us to leverage the fruits of the freedom that I spoke about just a moment ago across the broader organization. After all, matching does not exist in a vacuum, and we're expected to provide data and services internally as well. So finally, you know, obviously this is all a, a work in progress. We are constantly encountering challenges um, on this journey and learning how to overcome them. And I'm going to pass you over now to Gedeminas, who will take us on an exciting specific journey that we're having within matching. Thank you, James, for passing me the mic. Um, hello, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Gedi Minas, Manager of Data Science and Analytics. And today I will walk you through our journey uh, moving to transition of personalization with machine learning. So it won't be a tech talk. Uh, uh, it will be more like higher level overview, uh, but uh, feel free to ask any technical questions during Q&A. So let's jump to the agenda. So I will talk uh, about mainly four parts. We'll introduce you first about how this uh, personalization looks like at Vinted. Then we'll talk about uh, comparison, what we have before machine learning, and talk about the transition journey itself and the key learnings we got, and touch upon the future perspective and opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, so how does the personalization at Vinted look like right now? Uh, so basically, we empower search and discovery with machine learning. Uh, if you type uh, vinta.com and go to the first page, you will go to the homepage and you notice probably some blocks that are shown to you and may vary throughout like your journey. So those will be personalized blocks that are generated and recommended to you based on your historical click behavior and historical search patterns. And if you, for example, as the brand here and, and the left corner, uh, if you scroll down through the homepage, you'll see the news feed, which will contain a lot of items that are also recommended by machine learning algorithms. And if you type the search term in the in the uh, in search keyword in the in the search field, and or go to catalog and select the relevant sorting algorithm, it will activate, uh, once again, machine learning ranking algorithms to show you the most relevant items. Uh, so let's talk about our personalization system comparison, what we have before machine learning and what we have right now. So before machine learning, basically we, we had uh, uh, 
rule-based manual process. And uh, for example, we needed to come up with some user cohorts or user research uh, preferences for which we do database offline analysis and come up with the findings uh, how we would you know show what items you, you we should show to the user. And when it comes to like deployment, we had like uh, very mm, like limited ways how we can enforce the personalization. So we basically use uh, boosting algorithms that boost some attribute item attributes based on those analysis preferences. Whereas right now uh, we do it fully automatically. We do it the uh, data driven manner. So uh, when it comes to offline uh, uh, algorithm development, we use machine learning and we use user feedback to uh, to guide the algorithms to learn user references, for example, clicking patterns, purchase patterns, and et cetera. And uh, we develop uh, various complex architectures from decision trees, neural networks to more advanced architectures. And we can deploy those architectures in production using uh, high performance spe specific machine learning frameworks that enable to do so. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, so let's talk more about our transition journey itself and key learnings. <clears throat> so uh, looking retrospectively, transition journey using ML reminds me more of a Gartner cycle when you know you have this uh, innovation trigger, uh, which was our like motivation. Oh, we have a plenty of data, how we make our system data driven, you know, how to make our personalization data driven. And then it uh, triggers our curiosity and research. And we uh, started to investigate, you know, what that company is doing. We saw, and we saw like a tremendous effort and research and success stories and blogs and uh, other country, uh, companies are bragging about, you know, how machine learning helped them to personalize content through recommendation or ranking system. So we had like this, uh, achieve this peak of inflated expectations, you know, uh, that we can do it also. We can take those models, apply the knowledge, uh, train on our data and deploy. And we tried to do it. And of course, uh, we jumped to throat of disillusionment immediately. So after we uh, did the, the dedicated a lot of time to develop model, we dedicated a uh, significant time to deploy this model finally with the data in production. And we saw like failed David tests. So we then thought what's going on, uh, what, 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 what would be wrong? So then we started to dig uh, deeper uh, to go through uh, steps to the book, what, is, what, uh, what, what, what bad things could be uh, happening. So we found a bunch of things like online, offline machine learning and fitness match. Too slow production data pipelines, too complex models, uh, again, metric mismatches in online line, biases in models, and etc. And so we started to cope with those one by one. We like slowly uh, went to the slope of this enlightenment and we achieved finally first successful AIP test, which helped us go us through and learn our path to plateau to productivity. Uh, so when it comes to specific learnings about our journeys uh, and what I would do again, if I would uh, needed to move, you know, tra transition to machine learning and organization and especially personalization, the preparation stage uh, would be like, uh, would require you to focus a lot of environmental setup. Uh, by that, I mean, uh, flexible A-B testing in organization is a prerequisite, plenty of data to machine learning models. We're not talking about tens of thousands of you know events. It's like millions or at least hundreds of thousands. Flexible user tracking available, efficient data warehouses uh, for custom computation resources, etc. Uh, but the most important thing I think is the right talents. So for experimentation with machine learning, you need to have a data science and engineering uh, capabilities competence. Um, but this. Uh, this might be not easy. Uh, however, full stack machine learning engineers really can do miracles. And this is our like success story when we started only from few uh, machine learning engineers that really we're doing e e production uh, production uh, work. We're doing machine learning development work and we achieve amazing results with only ta talents of few people in the team. Um, then third, last but not least is like convincing stakeholders. Initially, it's very important to like, uh, go through the step over conventional product mindset to like uh, easily fast uh, 
result easily achievable fast uh, business gains and results you need to hope is this that you, it might take a one year to start seeing positive results with transforming with machine learning so the next step is kicking off uh, goal setting uh, is important at this stage uh, but not to drive the team into research trap for that i mean not to focus on far-fetched goals try to formulate intermediate goals that fit into one two sprint uh, week sprints uh, then uh, use this concept fail fast, learn fast, uh, start from simple machine learning models, approaches as much as possible that are easy to deploy, that may use like a only a naive set of, a small set of data that is easy to deploy in production. Experiment as much as possible uh, with an A-B testing. And the uh, third thing is know your business metrics at this st uh, stage quite well. So their product measures should really strong, uh, have a strong support towards your data science team. Uh, you need to uh, think with, uh, with, with, for example, uh, what metrics to use as in our case, we like maximize user experience, how we express uh, uh, user experience, whether it's, you know, sale or transaction and how we then, uh, you, what signals we use for the machine learning model. If uh, we are able to use, you know, the same signals to train the model and guide the learning patterns. Uh, yeah. So the third stage, when you like su uh, successful or unsuccessful launch your first A-B test, you need to like learn what how to what to do next, and there you need to focus a lot about um, knowledge gathering. Uh, knowledge gathering by I mean like growing teams' knowledge by participating in relevant conferences, drive internal discussions, and uh, participate in X week project. The X week projects that mean that we have uh, are called like one week projects that uh, diverse skills of experts from the whole winter. They can form team that works on. Um, any crazy idea products uh, and uh, and it's like most efficient way to learn uh, a lot of skills in short term uh, to ha have a high motivation to show your maximum and this is what we do and this is what works uh, for us uh, team skills and uh, competences like uh, at this point very important too because you have a lot of learning to do then you need to have a full uh, time data analyst dedicated to analyze this and of course, the focus on data or analytics engineering to support you on data availability, quality, and data pipeline automation. And the fourth uh, stage uh, is how to maintain the progress. At this point, uh, it's normal to have, you know, smaller and slower gains, which signals uh, for strategy and need of strategic goals. Uh, so strategic goals are like goals that you not focus on short-term gains, but uh, instead of long-term. And then you need to empower your seniors uh, most. Uh, you need to focus more on research here and uh, have different uh, expectations to the short-term. Uh, another thing is about your technological stack, technological performance. You need to, uh, this will be your bottleneck at this stage. For example, as in our case, uh, we had no feature store. Uh, and the uh, production pipelines, they, if you deploy more complex model, it takes more time. If you uh, deploy more like the uh, complex data, you also need to uh, take time to the user, you know, lagging of the delivery. So then you need to focus a lot of how to improve it, how to make it fast. And we did like reiterate the feature store from the bottom up. We reiterated the frameworks of machine learning, what we use. And this gave us again like new boost and a new way, new like gap where we can use this time resource to improve further our models. And data quality and monitoring at this point is also vital uh, because uh, the data quality and uh, marginal business gains could be highly affected by a small, uh, even small data quality, even some minor issues. So you need to put a lot of focus at this stage about this. And also monitoring it because in production you have you know to know what model inputs look like what the out look like whether it's okay or not uh, so that's how the key learnings look like let's touch upon our future perspective and opportunities at winter so currently our achievements with machine learning are really i would say huge uh, we achieve like uh, with personalization with machine learning alone in, in uh, different product areas around double digits of business gains uh in and throughout like few years and then talking about still opportunities remaining uh, there are plenty of 
uh, because we have uh, enabled uh, vintage in 17 countries and counting, we have like um, 1 trillion million of impressions through the year and, and we count, you know, hundreds of billions of clicks throughout the year. And this basically shows that we can adapt uh, our machine learning models to very deep personalization level to, to deliver even better experiences uh, but with machine learning. And the last thing I want to touch upon our future perspectives which basically I listed only four at this stage at this time. Uh, first being adapt latest AI advances, uh, which I mean like transformer architectures going through more like a, a, a more de enabling our user experience learning architectures. A second thing to really focus on real time recommendations and enable them because this is like a, it could be a game changer uh, of. Uh, adapting, changing user preference throughout the session and put the model, uh, ML machine models and recommendations uh, according to that. And third thing being utilize more diverse set of signals. So as, as uh, already James mentioned, no images and texts, uh, text information, we just scratch the surface on it. So we'll need to dig in deeper more because we see huge potential. And last but not least is about enabling personalization in more channels in our product. And not only answers, but search suggestions, more adaptive block rankings and notifications to mention a few. So thank you for your time and yeah, have a great evening and have a discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you both for the presentation. Uh, it, don't forget too, there's also a step of, of information security and, and data retention there. Plug, plug from the security and privacy teams at Vinted. We're, we're working hard with you guys and we really appreciate your help to keeping our, our members safe. Uh, I had a question about the, that, you know, uh, there was a step in there about learning what was important to the business. Uh, what we're calling that in my domain is, is, is speaking the language. How did you guys learn to speak the language of, of the business? take these things moving and keep them and, and give them traction. Good, I mean, I believe that was a question to you, but uh, <laughs> I think it was more on the product side. How did you, how did you learn how to speak with the product oh, managers? Tell basically, us. this is a non trivial task, sorry, my internet was lagging. Uh, it's not a trivial task. Usually you need to really think about what product manager needs to have at the end. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, improved metrics, you need to really show the potential, like uh, not to like, uh, if you talk, you know, in technical details, or if you, you know, over promise your delivery, you could lose in confidence in later stages. So you need to be very careful what you deliver and communicate the possible risks and uh, as expectations as clearly as possible. As I said, for example, one year expectation from like starting machine learning to having uh, first successful A-B test is kind of normal in my experience. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I like the, the phrase non-trivial there. That, that is the right uh, thing to apply. It's a skill to practice uh, and you don't get it right the first time, but don't don't give up. You'll, you'll learn to find a... Uh, a lexicon that you both can rely on. Thank, thank you both for the presentation, but we we do need to uh, to move along, and, and we're going to move along to uh, Jehan Darren Bogaz. He is the CTO at Text Cortex, and he will be talking about serving NLG models at scale and how they do that at Text Cortex. So, um, Jehan, it, the stage is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, <clears throat> yes. Mm, are you able to see it? Does it work? Okay, now? Yes? All right, perfect. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction, Adam. Uh, my name is Jehun, I'm co-founder at Text Cortex. Uh, about myself and the company a bit. Uh, so um, 
I'm working as a C2 at TextWorkX. I uh, founded the company two years ago, uh, which was actually started when there was no really so much why, like so much uh, chatter around uh, generative models. Actually, even before that, three years ago, it started as an open source project. And uh, yeah, the whole company actually started with the idea if um, someone would be willing to pay for money for a generative model that is something that is generated by a computer. And I was just like curious about the, the, the answer to this question. And it seemed like, yes, people are willing to pay for this kind of content. And uh, that was the start of the company. Um, after uh, years, we come to the point that we have uh, thousands of users. Now we have a Chrome extension that you can use generative AI models wherever you go uh, within whatever workflow that uh, you need it in. Uh, so yeah, that's about the company, about myself. I worked as I work as an engineer. Um, I started the first uh, um, I started the first infrastructure backend repo back in the days, and now it grow to a much bigger scale. Um, um, yeah, be yeah, that's about myself. Um, if we so today we are going to talk about the uh, generative models and how you can serve them at scale. That is something that we have um, that we need to solve. We needed to solve at the company and I will share some practical tips, uh, but there's mostly going to be very uh, simplified version of it. So um, if you heard about transformer models, so they are definitely not the transformer models that you know from the movies, uh, the transformers from the movies. They are a part of an AI algorithm um, that is using attention uh, layers and that is uh, that's why actually the AI got so smart in the recent years. Uh, before that, we always had the neural networks and uh, different kind of technologies, but it was never really smart smart. Uh, but after the attention is all you need, um, a paper from the Google AI team, things have changed, and now it comes to a point that it is really hard to tell if it's something is generated by a machine or by uh, uh, by a human. Uh, so we are at the limits of the string test and let's see where it will go. Um, so this is uh, our um, Chrome extension. Uh, so what we are what we are doing here is like basically after you install the Chrome extension into your browser, you can um, highlight the text that you want to write. You can give some prompts to uh, or like give some commands to the AI easily. Uh, and then it will respond with uh, whatever you need. So you can say like, hey, write me an email about this and this and that. And then it will write you a, a nice email. Or if you don't know what to write next, it can you can just like highlight something and then click on autocomplete and it will autocomplete the rest of the sentences. Um, so it's basically uh, uh, kind of like your helper. If you remember from like Word and Excel, like there was this uh, little... Uh, thing on the right side was like saying hello and stuff but was ne never really useful but it was always there so it's the same kind of thing uh, you can think about it but it's much smarter version of that uh, so we we just help you to do your stuff faster during the day is your like little helper um, that is also something uh, that now the models are able to do so there's a new productivity boom happening because of um, also in the create, creative markets there's like a, a huge amount of uh, stuff being produced every day by the machines uh, that's also part of um, this generative models it's called um, uh, diffusion um, and these diffusion models are able to take a, a prompt like you can say something like uh, give me a Shiba Inu that looks like French and then it will give you that and you can basically do many crazy other things. Uh, when I first started actually doing this um, this presentation, this kind of presentations, like it was not very, everyone knew about it, but now I guess like nearly everyone knows about it. So I wanted to give like a heads up about what this is about or how it works. Um, Apart from, of course, like this, all the fun stuff, there's even uh, crazier things happening. And these are the um, like things like alpha code, which is able to write code. Uh, now there's GitHub Copilot, which is I'm also using, by the way. It's amazing, works super, super well, uh, which is able to actually write code. Sometimes it writes code better than I am. And uh, I'm happy about it. Uh, at the same time, I'm not really sure how the future is going to look like. Uh, but it has already started, this uh, shift and revolution started happening, and it's here. Uh, you can check it out, different kind of uh, algorithms, or if you're a coder, you can use GitHub Copilot uh, for your use case to write code faster. 
um uh but of course like there is it sounds like super nice everything is really uh cool but at the same time there's uh, a crazy amount of memory requirement coming with all these gigantic models uh as you can see like uh the model sizes were like doubling to your doubling and uh, because of the Moore's law uh, it was also the AI models are also following the same pattern but recently it's uh completely changed uh so there was no breakthrough in I would say there was not really a breakthrough in the Moore's law, but um, I think people started like putting much more resource and that uh, changed. And they've also seen that, okay, increasing the parameter size uh, of the models are greatly uh, helping with the uh, quality of the output. So let's just like put in even more uh, parameters into it. But the problem is of course, uh, the processors or like the GPUs or like this tensor uh, processing units, they are not developing that fast. So they're lacking behind. And that is actually a huge problem because we've seen like an increased amount of requests coming in to, to our servers each day. Uh, but basically like the amount of uh, processing power is not there if we don't do the uh, proper uh, improvements. And I will talk about what are those improvements. And if you are willing to, if you want to do that, uh, show you how. So um, that's also like another thing, also the memory size is just like increasing and uh, memory requirements is increasing. As you can see, like on the green line on the screen, uh, these are the, the GPU models that, that has been produced by NVIDIA and Google. So as you can see the, the GPU, like this VRAMs, like the, the memory is not really increasing that much. Uh, but if you look at the uh, transformer model architecture sizes, they are going into the, the trillion parameter sizes, which is insane. Uh, I cannot even think about how they are running these models. Like we are having like so, so much trouble with uh, billion parameters. I have no idea how they are doing it with uh, trillion uh, parameters. Uh, but this is the case. Um, and as you can see, there's like there's not really the processors are not uh, or GPU RAMs are not following the same trend as the transform models are uh, doing. Um, so how are we going to serve these models? Uh, you are not going to <laughs> serve those gigantic models at production uh, because that would be an economical and an environmental disaster. Uh, instead of that, uh, what we are doing is creating more task-specific AI, so more energy efficient and economic to run. Uh, but of course, these gigantic models are great for exploration, creating data sets, and that's, the, that's why we are using these big models. And then we use these big models to train smaller models so that we can achieve better results. Um, so how you can do that also in your use case? Uh, of course, everyone is talking about the data. I will talk about the data as well. Sorry. Um, so what you need to do is like you need to be very specific about your use case. And then afterwards, you need to create a lot of data. Uh, you can use, uh, for example, an open AI case, like which is the they are the top AI uh, company in the world. Um, these guys are, what they did is actually they created their own data sets uh, out of uh, people. So they actually hired uh, contractors to write a lot of prompts and the answers to it. So they basically hired a bunch of humans to train an AI, uh, which was also the same case for um, computers to like for uh, self-driving cars. Uh, so they did the same thing for prompting. Um, and yeah, so what you can do is like, you can also uh, collect a lot of data or you can use bigger models to collect data and then afterwards uh, choose smaller base transform models and then train fine tune your uh, use case uh, on them. And that will increase uh, greatly the performance of the smaller models for this ta specific task. And at the same time, uh, you will be able to save a lot of money on your AWS or Google Cloud costs. Um, after you do that, like you have a small model, what you need to do is um, we, there's this kind of uh, infrastructure thing, but very simply, uh, you have to have an, a backend API, which is serving a lot of different requests. Um, and at the same time, you need to decouple that your whole AI inference thing, and you need to use queues. And this is a, a graph about like how we are doing it. Uh, so first, um, whatever like a request for AI model generation comes first to your pops up queue, and then you process it later on and then write it uh, data back to a database so that you can backend can read it or you uh, write it back to a queue. Uh, that is important. Why? Because it is um, 
inference AI inference takes a lot of time and you need to use some kind of uh, queue to manage all that uh, load. Um, and the other side, like you, we also, it's very basic, but like still how we're doing it, uh, we are building containers each time uh, when we want to fine tune or train models on an automated basis. And then we automatically store them in a, a cloud storage. You can be recently also start using Hugging Face. I can highly recommend it. Um, that's very easy to use. And yeah, that's how we are doing it. Uh, this uh, one e-commerce example that we have uh, from one of the customers. So what that is possible is like you collect some data and then afterwards um, use this uh, as a training data set. Um, and then afterwards, after the fine tuning, you can uh, your you can also you can also use this AI model to uh, create samples or generate text uh, that the model hasn't seen it before. Um, so that's what we did uh, for e-commerce. Um, that's like very simple um, example how you can do the same thing. Um, basically, you just need to collect a lot of data and then start uh, doing the fine tuning on it. The most important thing is the quality of the data you collect. Uh, so if there's garbage you're putting in, that's the garbage you're gonna get out of it. Uh, therefore, um, yeah, make sure that you have really, really high quality data, hire contractors and uh, annotate the data manually if required. And that is going to make the difference between an average product and a, a really good product. And thank you for listening. That was all from my side. Thank, thank you, Jihan. Really interesting and, and also really informative. It's I think that it's also very timely given uh, like the, the media explosion around around some of the things we got. We got GPT chat. We've got uh, the whole the, the the nifty work that they're doing on holographic wormholes. It has a little bit of of uh, I, I guess uh, connection here. I had a question for you about um, when you know both you and and the folks from Vinted mentioned starting with something small and then iterating on it and building it up and, and finding what works first before you before you, uh, you, you start to collect the, the really detailed stuff. How do you keep your engineers from prematurely optimizing or, or worse, scraping the, uh, creeping the scope out to something so huge that, yeah, it would be really cool if we did that, but that's gonna take years. How do you keep them focused? Uh, yeah, we are trying to focus on like, for example, on when they are creating GitHub issues or something like that, like to do lists uh, for uh, a developer, we have a checklist. So there are some bunch of questions you need to ask yourself before creating that issue. Uh, and if everything is checkmarked, then you can create this issue. And we have questions like, hey, if you're doing that right now, what is going to be the impact for the user experience uh, and how this is going to affect our revenue? <laughs> and they have to answer this clearly. If they cannot answer that, we most of the time don't go ahead and like create this issue ah yeah so there, there's a little bit of a of a gate to 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 cross there it, it also probably helps it sounds like that would also help them just be more commercially aware and more well-rounded engineers as well it's, it's something i would encourage everybody to like uh to adopt that kind of that kind of mindset and those kinds of processes um well we are just about at time I believe, unless and we have any more questions, last last chance from from the crowd out there. Once, twice gone. I I, I guess um, we we are just about done then. So I can thank all of you. Thank you, Jehan. Thank everybody for the the great episode that we've had. Thank you for the people who have participated, asking questions. This uh, presentation will be up on uh, YouTube and then posted over to LinkedIn later, so you can share it around with your friends. If you found something really interesting, also, uh, I, I believe the, the presenters will tag themselves or get tagged in it. So if you have follow up questions, I think that there's some really interesting things when you stop and think about it, about what the uh, the implications are for you and your teams, the technology and, and your users here. So if these things bubble up in your mind, please reach out. Let us know how we can help everybody uh, learn and grow together. If there's something that you would like to help people learn and grow about, please contact us here at the meetup group. I, I, as I mentioned before, there's a survey. Everybody who's attended or has signed up for the, the meetup event will receive an email with the link in it. But in case you missed that, here is again in, in the chat. Again, your feedback is very much appreciated. And we're giving you a little incentive with a, a 30 or a 20 euro uh, vintage raffle off for one lucky winter winner. 
if you if you got here somehow other than the meetup page, if you are watching this as a recording, for example, uh, please, uh, it would be great if you joined the group. That way we can interact with each other each other more in, in the new year. There'll be more events. Um, and we would love to have people who are both being members uh, and observing, but also coming and, and sharing. So if you have something you would like to volunteer for, people in your teams would like an opportunity to get the feel for presenting in front of an audience of strangers. That's one of the advantages of, of being part of a group like this. Um, and I've posted the the links for that uh, that meetup group again up at the top, and they'll they'll be in the email if you got them for them around. They'll also be on LinkedIn. Um, we also have this YouTube channel. Uh, we work at Vinted, where we'll be uploading the recording for this. But also, you can watch other things that come up. This is not the only type of event that we broadcast from the Vinted Studios here. We we do other types of things, and and it's good to keep an eye on that space and see. What's, what's interesting coming up from the great minds at Vinted. And then there's German Tech Jobs. It's a great platform to get connected with the German tech scene. So if you're looking for a way to do that, or if you'd like to get more involved, please check out germantechjobs.de and find different interesting communities to broaden your knowledge. Um, and we look forward to hearing all of your good stories and you sharing your future learning with the community. So please get involved. And until next year, it's been Adam Mullen, it's been Vinted, and it's been all my friends here. Have, have a great time. Have a great day.